Hey, I'm Swami Shanani. I am author of the School for Good and Evil series. The last book in the series, One True King, comes out on June 2nd uh, of this year. And I'm lucky here to be with the amazing audiobook narrator, Holly Lee, who has done six books, like 4,000 pages of reading. Um, first of all, I can't thank you enough for being, I think, the best audiobook narrator in history. I'm a little biased. Thank you, Soman. That is very kind of you to say. Thank you for writing the best books in history and giving me uh, ample work, uh, both in terms of volumes. Here we are at number six, One True King, number six. Um, but also in terms of characters and plot lines, and I've gotten to do it all. There's nothing I can't do now, thanks to you. Now that you've done School for Good and Evil and all the characters, and we'll talk about all the different characters you've had to do over the last seven years, my God. Um, years. It's crazy, right? Does every audiobook that you do outside of this now seem very easy? <laughs> very easy, super simple. I would say that most audiobooks, uh, I tend to do a range, uh, young adult, uh, tween novels, mid-grade, and then I do some mysteries and some romances and some thrillers, and maybe they top out at maybe four lead characters and maybe five or six peripheral characters. So with your 130 per book, <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing. And uh, nobody has exceeded you in character voices. And I wish I could, I had the technological genius to bring up the character sheet that you sent me for number five, uh, which was a huge list of who had repeated, who just had the odd line here or there. It was so helpful. And, I re and as I went into this book, I pulled that thing out of the archives and was like, thank goodness you did that for me last year because otherwise I'd have been lost. Um, because this is wonderful and all of all of those characters from all six books in seven years they all come back it's they all come back it's like a big grand reunion party um well before we get to all the questions of process i just wanted to talk a little bit about how you got on this whole thing to begin with because normally with i was a first time novelist with the school for good evil and usually with an audio book you get no say in your narrator they'll give you some options you know and then they'll be like and they kept sending me people and I, I just, you know, didn't feel the connection somehow. I couldn't feel the like, the liveliness of spirit, the kind of fluidity of voice to be able to navigate all the insanity of, of the book. But I had seen you um, in a lot of plays in New York through a mutual friend of ours named Anton Dudley, who is this amazing playwright. And I had seen <laughs> Polly play everything. I felt like Anton used you as kind of his catch-all for all his difficult parts. That's what I felt like you were there to do. Like, do you well, remember I'm... some of the parts you played for him? Oh yeah, I've played everybody from him. From I was a French pigeon in one of his plays. I was um, a, a young girl from Manchester in another of his plays. I feel like I've run the gamut. But what was fascinating about joining you was that you were very clear that uh, you wanted this kind of fairy tale voice. And so that was kind of my entry point to the first School for Good and Evil um, uh, was like how do you how does the main narration hold this kind of once upon a time feel when it's so uh, energetic and you know that most fairy tales feel quite antiquated and this is a very modern very energized mm. very vibrant fairy tale and so it was the the main way in was like how do I a hold these two lead women equal, uh, not tipping the scale in either direction and yet making their voices very uh, different uh, and yet the same, you know, that they're two sides of the same coin throughout the whole series. So that was the first question is how do I narrate these two women equally so as not to tip the balance in any moment and then, and then how to keep this very kind of lyrical fairy tale feel while being fully energized, you know, you have these amazing fight scenes all the way through book six, where there are yeah. thousands of people fighting with each other and great drama happens, great yeah. tragedy, great joy, all in the series of maybe 10 or 15 pages, and yeah. yet to keep the narration at this kind of heightened fairy tale feeling is really the yeah. one of the most exciting things I've ever done on stage or off, <laughs> on stage or behind a mic. The other thing that you're so good at doing is not overplaying 
the emotion of the scene. You know the character so well that you'll let the emotion sort of come out naturally. How did you handle in the first book especially when there's a lot of humor kind of built in? Did you look specifically for punchlines to deliver or did you sort of just um, focus more on developing the characters? How do you handle like comedy timing? Well, I think, Simon, not to toot your horn for you, but I think you write it beautifully. So my job is just to lay it out there as mm. I, when I read it, as I receive it, just to try and get that back. And I have to say, in book six, one of the exciting things is mm. that um, it has its, that you, you mentioned this to me when we were preparing it, but that it's an inverse of the pacing of the first five books. So the first five books, they start, uh, the train starts to go and then it builds and it builds and it builds and there's a huge yes, climax. Yes. Ta-da, wait for the next book. Yes, and yes, this yes. One, you're very, you're crafting it so carefully so that every character has an ending and has their moment in the sun and has a bow tied on their story. And I think that that change of pace, like as, as I was reading through it, I was like, oh, w once again, my job is just to get out of the way and honor the pacing with which you've written it, the typeface, the, you know, the pictures, they all speak to pacing and, and um, how you arrive at humor, things like that. That's all in the punctuation. That's all in where the page turn is. And right. for me, as a book narrator and as a stage actor, I take very seriously the way things are laid out on the page, the mm -hmm. way, you know, where the pictures fall in the book, you know, and yeah, I try to yeah. honor, even though you don't say, oh, P.S., there's a picture here, <laughs> you know, that right. you try to honor the fact that, you know, this chapter starts slower because there's this beautiful, illustration right here as opposed to the next chapter where it will be a whole block of text and then the next page is the illustration so i think that pacing is a lot to do with it and then just honoring your amazing words and you know that it's your sense <laughs> not mine but, I but it's funny because this is the one thing that you'll do in, a, in the world as an actress where you don't have the writer in the room to give feedback or sort of talk about, you know, what's in my head. You Usually you're there with somebody who can give, you know, direction if, if you really like audibly mess up on something. But most of the time you're directing yourself, no? Like 98% yeah. of the time? Yeah. How's and I that? Would say book six, even more so, because usually at least there's another person in the room with me. So I can say like, oh, did that, did that feel good to you? Is there a way mm -hmm. that I could land it better? Better. like this is the way I hear the joke is that what you're hearing when I say mm -hmm. it or this is the way I you know your great romance scenes that you do where you know they're yeah. they're always so sensual and meaty and you know mm -hmm. and I'm just in a room on my own with a microphone and so I do it and then yeah. usually I get to say to the engineer or the director did that did that get the juiciness did you feel yeah, that yeah. was that was that sweet did it sound too harsh you know whereas with book six I was here quarantined in my house on my own so I really was like Ugh. it took me a long time to do this book because I double guessed myself so often I was like oh someone would be cringing if he were <laughs> no well, the uh, other funny thing is normally anybody else in my life will tell you how controlling and micromanagerial and dictatorial I am about anything in my work like I'm a total nightmare and I feel like I mean, ask anybody, anybody who was involved in anything, except you, like whenever, like we, like there was a little bit of a problem with trying to get you for this one because of the quarantine and having to do it in your house and everything. And I was like, the only person who could ever do it, I don't care if uh, Polly has to do it in her bathroom. Like she's the only person that you can give an entire book to and just let her go. About, I have a question for you now. I'm interested that you say that you're a micromanager and mm. uh, a control freakish, which I, as we discussed, have not experienced at all. Mm. Is there a character that you identify that you're like, this character is me? Or are they all a composite or are none of them like you in any way? I think there's bits of me in all of them. Sophie is very, very close to the real me. I think it, her chapters always were the easiest to write because it's exactly what I am thinking. Sophie is what um, I would be if I was a girl, 100%. Like every, down to her every reaction, I think she's the closest to me. Um, Agatha is sort of my conscience. She's what I think <laughs> should happen, but I don't necessarily do. And Tedros is just my frustration with like my, my 
um, own masculinity and what I see of masculinity out in the world. So, which is why I think he's such a wreck. <laughs> the other thing I was gonna say is when you were building these initial characters, and this is the other thing I was thinking about, because I have to go back and listen to how they evolve over the books. Tedros in book one is, you know, useless and sort of bratty and immature. And by the time you get to five, he's starting to grow into to really a man because he's getting older and stuff. Did that affect the way you voiced him at all, you think? Or even think, with Sophie and Agatha? Uh, I think that Sophie and Agatha, um, I think they definitely matured. Their, their worries grew as they grew. Mm -hmm. um, their concerns and how their goals, who they want to be in the world, um, definitely matured. With Tedros, I would say it's much clearer. The things that happen to Tedros, books one through three, are so um, finite. We, we explore his head less, that, that in your chapter breaks, we're much more in books one and two going back between Sophie and Agatha, Sophie yes. and Agatha. Yes, yes, yes. Just, you get more and more like in book five, um, Professor Dovey had a whole chapter narrated from her point of view, which I'd never done in this series before. Yes. I was like, oh my, I didn't know how to speak in her <laughs> voice for a whole chapter. Like it was a real, yes. like, whoa, <laughs> I would have yeah. made a different vocal choice for her had I known. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Oh my uh, God. Um, I feel like in book six, like he's really grappling with, I mean, it's interesting that you say that he represents your kind of vision of masculinity because he's really grappling with what it means to be a man in terms of how he loves his girlfriend, in terms of how he wants to be in the world and work in the world and, you know, the responsibilities that are familial, the responsibilities that he's choosing. Like, I really mm. think his journey in book six is fascinating and really, really grown up, considering that in book one, he was a cipher. It was just like this. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, just from a basic, very sort of process point of view, what do you do when you voice a boy? Because if you're just like, blah, 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 like, whatever, it, it's not going to sound like a guy. What do you have to do in order to make it feel like a boy versus a girl? Well, I had a producer, uh, John Marshall, which is the, which is the producer of uh, School for Good and Evil uh, mm -hmm. through, I guess, the publisher of School for Good and Evil through HarperCollins. Mm -hmm. And they say I'm very active. And when I tend to narrate, like their job is to make sure the mic is wide open so that mm -hmm. I could, because I move around a lot and I pull funny mm -hmm. things. things and, um, and that narrator said that whenever I do Tedros, I sit down in the chair and he's like, oh, she doesn't go much lower because she's going to be off mic. And so I think there, for me, there with right. Tedros, it's just lowering your voice. But yeah. there's also a sense of, I believe in all acting, uh, stage, film, and uh, narrating books, there is a, a way that you inhabit the character in your body. And yeah. if you're not... Um, uh, it's gonna like for instance Albemarle was one of my favorite voices to do I love doing Albemarle he didn't speak very yeah. much but when he did yes because I felt like I nailed it I was like Who else yeah, yeah 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 and uh with Albemarle uh I do a, like a like a woody woodpecker for yes, yes 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 yeah and I so mean, I feel like the body is there even though you're trying to be so still and so quiet in the room you know it's 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 a physical job to narrate a book, weirdly. <laughs> in, in especially in these books, once we establish the baseline of the characters, there's so much messing about that happens. So that, to me, the hardest thing I think you probably would have had to have done in the series, and I still don't know how you pulled it off, but it worked in absolutely successful fashion, was you had to play Sophie as a boy in the second book for a significant part of the second book because she turns into a boy named Philip. So then you have to do like Philip Tedros emotional kind of seduction scenes between a girl playing a boy and a boy. I mean, it's impossible. When you saw that, were you like, what, what do I do? I, I what, and I think, uh, I think we talked about it where I was we like, I don't know how to do this. And I don't know if I need more language than is in the book around who is speaking when. And you were like, no, you can't have it. Mm -hmm. you Work as is, you know, like, um, I think it's one of the hardest things I've done. And also, this is, I don't want to be a spoiler, so I'm not going to say who, but in book six, there's a character who ages. And mm -hmm. that was the 
thing. It was like, how do you infuse this character that the audience knows as one age as a different age and still have their personality come through as with Philip, still have Sophie's personality come through, but have her have this totally different voice when all I have is the voice and that's already conjured an image for people in their minds as they've been listening, you know. Yeah. It's uh, the aging and the girl to boy uh, transition uh, will forever be like, I, I don't know that I was successful, but I certainly had a good time trying to figure it out, definitely. No, I just think that, that more than most books, I think the audience has gotten very attached to you as a narrator. Like the running joke I always say is like, whatever the reviews are for the books on Amazon or Goodreads, the audiobook will always be at least like like 30% higher. <laughs> because I could like, I just think you have a way of making them feel like they are in it. And I think sometimes people don't like being read to because the narrator can't possibly capture the amount of imagination in their heads. And I think with this book, there's so much going on that often the audiobook can clarify the emotional stakes between characters sometimes. Can you think of a scene, um, we'll stay away from book six for now, but in the first five books that really st you know, st stayed with you or a, a scene that you just had the most fun narrating or even a chapter, you know, anything that sort of stuck out as, as a moment where you just sort of got lost in it and were having a lot of fun? Yeah, I mean, I think the end of book one is mm. like, that will resonate with forever that I just I I all of book one I felt was so beautifully nuanced in the complexities of morality and growing up and the end of book one just clinched that for me and I and I think that moment often it just in my life where I'm like you know how do you how it's not an a or b choice you know and um there were so many just purely emotional moments. I'm not a big crier in my real life, but I feel like in this book, particularly, um, I want to say three, um, the end of three was just very emotional for me that, that I had to stop a number of times in the booth and be like, I'm just going to take a minute because it's getting a little froggy, you know, that, um, that yeah, there's just, the way you do romance, nobody else does it that well. And, you know, you I think it's because it I'm so such a frustrated romantic. Someone was like, what did someone come to me at a, at a reading? I would think I was tired on a book tour and I was getting to the end of my rope. And they were like, you know, why can't Sophie ever find true love? And I said, imagine a person who works very hard their whole life to find somebody worthy of them and they can't find them no matter what they do. Like, and then my friend looks at me and they're like, but you still try very hard, so much. <laughs> so I feel like, like, romance to me is not like I'm writing something from necessarily experience. It's this frustration of like, why can't it be like this? Or like, why is it like, it's almost like an exorcism in a, in a, which is different than I think writing fantasy. To me, it's like uh, channeling some sort of primal rage about how I wish the world would be you know i don't know and what, what what has been over again the five books let's say what has been your favorite piece to write like is there a particular scene that sticks with you that you're like this is the this is the piece i think it's whenever i'm doing something that i think will get me in trouble so like when sophie turns into a boy and has these emotional conversations with tedros as boy to boy but he's a girl she's a girl obviously in love with him and he clearly has feelings for this boy that deep down he must know subconsciously as a girl and then in book three when agatha and tedra switch genders again and remember they have these like weird emotional scenes kind of lying in bed talking to each other as boy and girl to girl to boy and like i think it's those kind of scenes where i have to actually question to myself you know what does this mean i think to me part of the experiment in books one through uh, two and three were the fact that I felt like if everybody in the world, everybody, you know, in America especially, got to experience life as the other gender for a day, it would totally change the entire way we, we operate with each other, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think just getting to, to write that, you know? And I think even like, I was thinking about the way we operate in quarantine, these kind of like life-shifting 
forced impositions that completely change the way we think. And I think that's really what fairy tales in a way is all about, are these kind of like forced interventions, you know, yeah. where like big things happen. Um, and do it, like how do you, um, how say with gender, how do you think about writing from a girl's perspective? Like your two lead characters are women, are, are girls. And do you, do you in the same way that I, I have to embody Tedros differently, yeah. do you embody them? Do you move when you write? I That's think to me, comments. like, and it's funny because we'll see if you felt this way when you're writing them. To me, Sophie operates at almost like a higher pace of energy everything's kind of like it's trying to force life to happen her way so she's trying to actually like steer the like river of life in a certain direction whereas mm -hmm. like agatha everything's a little slower everything's a little more like deliberate and considering it's like you know have you ever you know who fran lebowitz is the new york uh mm -hmm. personality she was talking about yes. mayor de blasio or something and she said this thing that made me laugh so hard because I understood it from a Sophie point of view, which is like, she's like, anytime I see him on TV and he's talking, I'm just like, he's operating at too slow a pace. Every time I see him, I want to be like, come on, come on. <laughs> and that's how I feel Sophie is in the world of like, come on, come on, like move things faster, right? And so I think that's how I sort of wrote her. Agatha was a little more slow and deliberate. And Tedros to me was always like clenched. Everything was always like very tight and like, he couldn't express himself well, and so he was just always like pent up versus something like Hort, which was a more like Sophie, like a free flowing emotional stream of consciousness all the time, you know. Um, the Hort's an interesting one because I think when the books start, he's sort of like a weasel and kind of like a pest, and then he grows into this kind of like big character by book three, four, five. Did you have yeah. to change the way you voiced him at all? No, I mean, he uh, has the uh, advantage of turning into a huge uh, wolf, right? So he always had two kind of voices anyway. And so oh, it was yeah. just, as, as uh, say, when he and Nicola met, it was just about blending those two. Like, I felt like that was just as you so astutely put earlier, it's just about growing up. Like he, he managed to just kind of blend his wolf side with his weasel side as he, as he kind of matured, I guess. Um, uh, but it was interesting to see the characters that did get kind of uh, a more front, front footed uh, role um, and the ones that, that didn't, that, that, you know, Kiko, as we've discussed, was always a favorite of mine and she never got her moment in the sun, you know, and I was like, come on. No, and it's funny so book because six she, was like, yeah, because she is such a popular character amongst the fans and I almost felt like, I liked the idea of a character that is stuck on something and can't get out of it because I feel like that's also real life. You have certain people who just don't develop <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah whereas others make huge leaps and bounds you know i don't know which character did you have to work the most uh, most kind of like process wise to come up with a voice where you actually have to practice it think about it mold it the most and which one did you just like the moment it came out of your mouth that was it you didn't even have to think about it I think Agatha and Sophie were very clear to me, both of them. Like, uh, I, I'm interested in your fast pace, slower pace, because mine was like slightly higher pitch, which automatically you speak a bit faster and slightly lower pitch. Um, uh, in terms of process, it, it was very important to me that Dovey be a kind of classic fairy godmother kind of a sound. And so I, I was like, what does that mean? for this market uh, in, in the States versus in the rest of the world. And then uh, I guess like I thought a lot about like, she's one of the few American characters, American characters in the book. She has an American accent. And I did it on purpose because I was thinking a lot about the kind of movies that we see fairy godmothers in. And obviously they're all made in Hollywood, so they're all more mm -hmm. American. And so I was just like, I, for me, her voice, she was one of the few that it felt right to make her more American. Which was a and shock then, like, when I first heard it. Uh, that, that was a big surprise to me when I first heard it, because at first I was like, who is that? 
and then I, I listened to it and I instantly understood what you were doing. That was the one voice that completely didn't match what I had in my head, but I loved it because I thought it was, ex it was exactly right. You know what I mean? Were there any that you were like, she did not get that voice right? I feel like I, I know that I have some like, oh, that just never worked out. It was supposed to be one thing and it didn't quite nail it. No, I think, I mean, I think of, there were times I gave you impossible tasks. Like, I think having to play those mongooses for a little bit was <laughs> not particularly fair. To play Indian mongooses with very, very weird Indian names. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, like, a lot. <laughs> like, oh, there's fun. times where I'm just like, you know, and it's not like I'm there in there with you, so I can't even help. Like I can just imagine you on this like ship in the middle of the ocean getting to that page and looking at like these 12 Indian mongoose names and being like, what am I supposed to do? You know? Um yeah. well, I wanted to thank well, you so much for wait, I have saying? one more. Oh, tell well, me, tell me. Been with this series for seven years, like probably longer in your mind. Will you Will you miss it? Are you feeling the lack already? Are you like, actually, there is a book seven. <laughs> it's just a weird feeling because after three, I felt like I wasn't quite done. And I pretended I was. And then I just realized that I had kind of done my kind of Harry Potter-esque school years. But it always ends after the school years. And I wanted to see what happens when you go out into the world. And I just had this huge idea and story and, and it almost felt like one through six was meant to be together. When I finished six, I was done. And it, what's also funny is I turned in the final, final draft, the one that you ended up reading um, on March 11th. And then I came down to Florida on the 12th and sort of the world exploded. And so in a way, like instead of having to take a three month vacation or a two month vacation to wipe it clean from my mind, the, mind, the, the world kind of reset on its own. Mm -hmm. And so that headspace of writing those books is kind of gone for now. I think I sort of had my kind of emotional experience through it. And I think having you having read one through six and you being really the only person in the world who's read six totally all the way through carefully, I think you can feel like by the end of six, it's finished. You know, it's, I think we have come to the end. And so I don't know, I didn't have that big party moment because I think the parting moment came in writing it. I think I said everything I had to say, you know. I, and now I it love was... how you wrap everything up. There are no, no straggling ends for That's anybody. I did. Yeah, I didn't want, I wanted people to feel like, okay, like they can go to sleep at night feeling like, like it's done and whatever happened, good or bad, you know, happy or sad, there is an ending and, you know, there's no more to be written for now. And so it's been easy for me to, to move on, you know, I think. But I hope that we get to work on something again soon. But we'll find something, because we have to. This is like the only way I can work. You're the only person that can challenge me now, so <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Oh, God. Well, we'll, we'll find a way. And, and um, you know, we'll, we'll stay in touch. And I'll keep putting you in front of the kids, because I get so many notes. and messages all year long about um how much they love the books through your voice so well, the greatest part is it's gonna live your voice will live forever in a lot of these kids heads so. i'll be sounding more and more like dovey but they'll know <laughs> <laughs> well thank you polly i appreciate it um and hopefully i'll see you when we can actually hang out in person i can give you a big hug yes so. all right bye love bye